QuickBooks Online 2024. Enter transactions for the purchase of inventory using bank feeds overview. Get ready and some coffee because we're meeting the deadline with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online bank feed practice file we set up in a prior presentation. Let's open up the major financial statement reports as we will start to do every time. The reports on the left hand side within the favorites. We've got the balance sheet, I'm gonna right click on that, open link in a new tab. We've got the profit and loss, I'm gonna right click on that, open link in a new tab. I would also like to add the trial balance to the favorites, it's at the bottom under the accountant. They put it way at the last report down here for my accountant, it deserves better. It deserves better. So I'm gonna bring it up to the top, making it one of the faves. And then I'm gonna right click on the trial balance and open that in a new tab as well. Let's tab to the right now and close up the hamburger and we'll do a range change. I've been working in the first two months. So we're gonna go from 01024, tab 022924, 29 days in February, 2024. It's a special time people, special time. We're gonna say months and then run it. So there we have it. Let's go to the tab to the right. Let's close up the ham boogie. And let's change that range to the same. 010124 tab 022924. Selecting the drop down so we can see it month by month on the side by side. Run it to refresh it. Tab into the right one more time on the trusty trial balance, a good old TB. We're going from 010124 tab 022924 tab. Run it to refresh it. Remembering that we always want to have an eye on these major reports, at least the balance sheet income statement or possibly the trial balance, which is the balance sheet on top of the income statement, because this is the end result. This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to make possibly just for taxes at the end of the year or for other external and possibly internal reporting needs. Let's go on to the first tab now. And now we're going to go into the transactions and we have uploaded our bank feed. So we're in the banking transactions. And now we're thinking about inventory transactions. So we've been looking at the outflow of transactions, which is often where the bank feeds fit best, especially for small businesses who are not dealing with accounts payable, but rather making electronic payments as they become due for things such as the telephone, the utilities, other utilities and whatnot. So now we've looked at some more complicated type of areas that deviate from that simple kind of setup. Uh, which don't happen oft, as often depending on the business, such as the fixed assets, purchases of large things. And then now we have inventory. So inventory is only going to be an issue if you sell inventory, obviously. So if you're in a kind of business where you don't deal with inventory, if you're a gig worker, if you're a YouTuber or something like that, then you're just going to get paid by YouTube and you don't have to deal with inventory. If you're a bookkeeper, you might not have any in inventory. Lawyers don't have any inventory. They have their own problems. There's other specialized things that you have to deal with, such as possibly a job cost system in a service area, but you don't have inventory and that could make it easier. But if you're in a business where you deal with inventory, then there's a couple different ways that you might have to deal with inventory. And obviously you're going to be purchasing inventory. That's when the inventory is going to impact the bank feeds. And then when we sell the inventory, 
then again, we might have an impact on the inventory at the point of sale. So let's take a look at a flow chart. This is a QuickBooks desktop flow chart that we're using for online purposes because we just wanna look at the flow of the forms, which will be the same and uh, get an idea of how the bank feeds would fit in depending on the type of inventory business that we are using. Now, inventory is, is one thing that's gonna impact both the purchasing side, the vendor cycle, as well as the customer side, the sales cycle, because we're gonna be purchasing inventory, increasing our inventory, and selling inventory, decreasing our uh, inventory. Now, let's go from the easiest inventory processing method to the most difficult inventory processing method. As we know with the bank feeds, the easiest thing to do is to just expense something on a cash-based system as they, the thing clears the bank. As we pay for inventory, in other words, we'll see it come through the bank feeds. The easiest thing to do would be just to expense it at that point in time. So in some businesses, you might be able to get away with that because if you're not holding on to a lot of inventory, for example, and possibly you're, you're buying inventory specifically for a particular customer because it's a, because it's a custom order or possibly you're creating something and you're making something that doesn't take a whole lot of time to to create it's not like you're creating it's not like a job cost kind of system where you're constructing a building or something you're making a necklace or something like that well then it's likely that by the time you get the materials to the turnaround time some necklaces i'm sure take a long time i don't know but i'm just saying that you would think that, that when you buy the inventory to the turnaround time when you when you sell the inventory you're not holding on to a lot of inventory so in that kind of situation you might do the easy thing you might still be able to say i'm dealing with inventory but i'm not going to track it on the on the balance sheet as an asset but just expense it when i purchase it so that would be the easiest thing to do you would just have the same kind of thing where you'd have uh, it comes through the bank feeds and you would use an expense form, which is like a check form, recording it to cost of goods sold, which means that you would have the cost of goods sold actually increasing the expense related to selling inventory before you sold the inventory, before you have the related income, which isn't exactly proper. However, if the time frame to the point where you sell the inventory is pretty close, then after you do that, you're going, you're going to then have an invoice or possibly you sell the inventory and see the money come through on the bank feeds on the deposit side of things, at which point you use a deposit form if you're doing a cash-based system and you record the revenue when you get the deposit. And if those two are pretty close to the same time, then you might be able to get away with that. That would be the easiest thing to do. It would be a cash-based kind of system. However, if you have a significant amount of inventory, then you can't generally do that. So if I'm buying a stockpile of inventory, I'm warehousing the inventory and then selling the inventory. Possibly I've, let's imagine that I came up with a, a custom product that I have a patent for and I went to China and I asked them to manufacture it in China and they're going to basically ship it to me and I'm going to hold on to it and then try to sell it or something like that. Well, then I have to track the actual inventory that I that I have on hand and there's going to be a significant difference in time between when I buy the inventory and when I sell the inventory therefore when I purchase the inventory I'll still see it come through on the bank feeds uh, as I purchase it but it's not exactly proper to record it just as an expense at that point in time because really it's it's a similar situation as the equipment if you purchased a building the building as we saw, hasn't made us money yet. So the, the big example here is like, if I, bought a, if I bought equipment, it's natural for us to say, if I spent like $100,000 on a forklift or something, I'm not just going to expense it at the point in time I paid for it, because then I won't be able to match one period to the other, one month to the other in terms of performance. It makes sense to put it on an asset, to say I have an asset of that amount, and then I'm going to consume that asset or it's going to deteriorate in value as I use it over its useful life. Then we'll allocate using depreciation expense. With the inventory, it's the same kind of thing, right? When I buy the inventory, I haven't, I haven't used it yet. I'm going to possibly be selling the inventory months into the future. And therefore, you should put it up, we should put it on the books as an asset. And then at the point in time, we actually consume it. We use it. How do we use it? We sell it that's the point in time that we should be uh, expensing it. And 
even if you don't want to do that for tax purposes, you might be required to do that as well in the United States. So you're going to have to deal with that uh, in some way, shape or form. So there's a couple ways that you could do that. Then you could track the the inventory within QuickBooks, and that would be using a perpetual inventory system in which we're actually tracking the units of inventory and the and the the cost of the inventory, which is going to complement complicate our bank feeds in the system. You could try a system where you track the inventory in terms of units externally. That's another way that you might be able to simplify things and still use the bank feeds. You might say, hey, look, I'm going to track the inventory on an external worksheet on Excel, or possibly your inventory is an online store like a Shopify, an eBay, an Amazon. If you're using those, we have another course or section on that. And QuickBooks has its own tools that you can try to integrate with that. But the idea there would be that you might, most people would recommend that you might not want to pull all of the inventory transactions from a Shopify store, for example, into QuickBooks and try to track the inventory on a perpetual system within QuickBooks because you can track the units of the inventory on these other stores on the other platform, on the Shopify platform or on Amazon. And you're only going to clog up your, your QuickBooks system by adding all that data into QuickBooks. What you could do instead is simply do an adjusting entry periodically when you need to, possibly at the end of the month, or if you're just doing it for taxes, you know, at the end of the year with the help of uh, the accountant. And then you can take the information from your other system uh, in terms of units and create an adjusting entry for uh, your your books. So that's the other method that uh, that we could use. Or you might be doing it in Excel. So you might use Excel, for example, and you're just counting the inventory, which you could do on a nightly basis, on a weekly basis, or on a monthly basis. And when you buy the inventory, you'll see it come through with a check form still. Uh, but instead of recording it on a perpetual system, you're just going to record it as uh, an increase to inventory, not tracking the units within QuickBooks. And then you'll track the units uh, in an external worksheet using a cost of goods sold calculation. So that would look something like this. This is like a FIFO uh, type of worksheet where you have the purchases, uh, the cost of goods sold, and then uh, the, the inventory. So when you purchase the inventory, then uh, you, you're going to record it in QuickBooks, but just at the dollar amount. And then you might track the actual quantity of purchases in Excel. So for example, here it costs us $400. And, I mean, I'm sorry, 400 quantity, 55 cost dollars per unit. So the total cost was 22,000. That's what we would record in QuickBooks to 22,000, but not the number of units. I'm counting the units externally. And then as we... Uh, sell the inventory, what ends up happening is is you would have to use a flow assumption because, and that would be the first in, first out, weighted average are the most common to, or, or LIFO, but weighted average are first in, first out because the inventory, even though we have the same amount of inventory, the same kind of inventory could change in dollar amount. So that's what gets a little bit uh, confusing with it. But the the idea would be on, on the worksheet, the simple calculation on the worksheet would be, okay, what if I just do this? I'm going to format this cell. I'm going to, I'm going to format Excel and go to do currency da, 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 and then no dollar sign. No. And then I'm just going to say that my beginning inventory, let's, let's imagine at the beginning of the night, if, if I do this on a daily basis, I had, let's say 130 units. And then let's say we purchase uh, another uh, 40 units. Then we have inventory available, which equals the sum of these two. I could have sold then 170 units. The ending inventory, we're going to say we count it. We count the units that are left. And if there are only like 60 units left, we imagine that we sold this equals this minus this, we sold 110 units. See, I can do this calculation on a periodic basis, possibly at the end of the night, the end of the week, the end of the month, the end of the year, 
and then do an adjusting entry. So I'm going to imagine that in QuickBooks, I record all my inventory purchases as purchases, tracking just the dollar amount, not the units. I track the units externally, such as this with a physical count and a flow assumption, which gets a little bit more complicated. And again, we have other courses or sections on that, but the general idea is we, we do this calculation and then I can determine how much was sold, allowing me to just do a journal entry in QuickBooks, decreasing the amount that, uh, that we have in inventory and recording the related expense periodically instead of perpetually uh, on, on the books. So that's the second method that you can do that can kind of be more uh, reliant on the bank feeds. You can, you can track inventory uh, externally. That's the idea. And then if you did inventory within QuickBooks and you wanted to track the inventory within QuickBooks, then it's going to complicate the bank feed system. When I purchase the inventory, I can still purchase it. I'll still see the purchases going through the bank feeds, but I'm going to have to use what we call items in order to track the units of inventory and not just the account of inventory, not just the dollar amount. And that becomes, that becomes a little bit more of a mess. And therefore I might have to actually record the transaction first as an expense form and then use the bank feeds to match rather than using bank fees to record the transaction. When I sell the inventory, then the inventory should decrease as I make the sale. And this is the same thing that happens when you check things out at like a grocery store, you know the sales price, but the system also is decreasing the inventory in terms of units as well as dollar amount. To do that in QuickBooks, you usually have to use the sales forms, invoices and sales receipts, which again are not the forms that we see when we record a deposit in in uh, in the bank feeds. The bank feeds record a deposit form, which isn't the form that allows us to track the inventory. So again, we'll have to then use more of a full service accounting system, recording the sale of inventory with a sales receipt or an invoice, and then use the bank feeds possibly to match out to those transactions, or we, we enter the invoices, and then we put on our side the deposit and then we use the bank feeds to match it out. So we'll look at some of those different, those different scenarios in uh, future presentations. Let's try to look at it one more way over here just to get an idea. If you're doing a full service accounting system within QuickBooks, it would require you to use the forms because if I go to the forms up top and I was to use an expense form, for example, to purchase the inventory, I usually don't assign it simply to a category because then QuickBooks cannot track the subledger if I'm on a perpetual inventory system. But instead I have to use the items. And this items tab isn't basically there generally uh, in the bank feeds. So we'll check it out when you do the bank feeds, you might not have the capacity to add the item, which means you can't track the inventory in a perpetual inventory system. So therefore, even though the bank feeds create an expense form, you're going to have to basically do the expense form yourself to put the proper item in place and then use the bank feeds to simply match to the expense form that you put in place if you're using a perpetual inventory system. When, when you sell the inventory, notice it's going to come through the bank feeds with a deposit form eventually, right? But the deposit form doesn't have an item on it. So we can't, so we can't record, we, can't, we, we can only assign it to a, a revenue account. Instead, when we sell the inventory, if using a perpetual inventory system, I have to use an invoice or a sales receipt. If I, use, if I use these forms, once again, I have a product item down here that I can assign it to. And if you're also, if you're tracking inventory within QuickBooks, then you have, you have to set up the items, which are in the sales tab and the products and services. And so you really want to think about if you want to do that or not, because uh, because if you have a lot of different types of inventory, tracking the items within QuickBooks can be somewhat tedious and is one of the places where there are some limitations, QuickBooks not being as good as possibly some other, or you might need to upgrade and whatnot in order to really get a, get a detailed tracking of inventory. It's one of those areas that are kind of specialized. So it could do some basic tracking of inventories, but if you have a whole lot of different types of inventory, then then you want to think about what's going to be the best process for dealing with inventory. Do you want to track it within QuickBooks 
or or not? Do you want to track it using some other kind of method and then do periodic adjustments? All right, if I look at the bank feeds, let's go back to the uh, dash here and transactions. So notice if there was a money out like this one here, like an Office Depot, if I, if I look at this one, again, it's this will create an expense form, but note that there's no place to put a an item, the inventory item. That's the problem. Uh, so we can't really assign it to an item. Okay. So let's first just imagine like the easiest system, and then we'll take a look at some examples in future presentations of the other systems. So remember the easiest system would be, I'm purchasing inventory, I'm gonna turn around and sell it, you know, right after I purchase it. Therefore the timing, there's no timing difference. I'm not holding on to inventory for a long period of time. So maybe I can get away with just being on a cash based system. And then in the in next presentation, what we'll do is we'll dive into, well, what if we're using a periodic system to track inventory doing an accrual thing in that case. Uh, and then and then we'll take a look at the different and what if I'm doing a, a perpetual method. All right. So the easiest thing here, let's say Office Depot, we buy from Office Depot, and then we, we, we tweak it or we or we sell it after we purchase it from Office Depot. So we buy some whatever, some wood there, we whittle it down, and then we sell it, right? It doesn't take a lot of time. So we're going to say, all right, then I'm just going to say we bought it from Office Depot. This time, I'm not going to be putting it to machinery and equipment. I'm going to put it to inventory. Uh, not inventory, though. I'm not going to put it to the asset, but rather to cost of goods sold. So I'm going to put it directly to the expense, even though I have not yet, I have not yet sold it, right? Because I'm going to sell it pretty soon. And so I'm going to say, there's the tag. It's going to go to, uh, to Office Depot. I could create a rule for it if this is my normal business. Although again, I have to be careful with an Office Depot because sometimes I might be purchasing like inventory and sometimes I might be purchasing supplies. So you have to be, so that's one of those areas where you might be able to get some more complex rules to try to distinguish between if you're purchasing supplies or, or inventory or uh, possibly machinery and equipment. I'm not gonna make a rule for this one though because we're just gonna do an example uh, for it. So let's go ahead and so it's got the vendor. Let's go ahead and s confirm it. <clears throat> and so now if I, if I go to the tab to the right, these, I'm sorry, category. <laughs> I'm apologizing to the microphone again. I'm gonna go into the, uh, and here, there it is. So off it, no, that's the thousand dollar one. We just did this one. So, so there it is. And then if I, I believe that's the one, right? Yeah, because there's no rule applied to it. Okay. And so then if I go to the tab to the right and I run it, uh, we obviously, if I go into the checking account, we're going to see the transaction in the checking. So we put it, uh, did I do the one for February? I think I did it in February. Let's go back. And yeah, it's in February. So I'll go into February. And then, so there it is. The other side's going to cost to get sold. It was created with an expense form. If I go into that, it shows the expense form. And here's our expense form. Notice it, it was assigned to the category not to an item. This is the one that would track the units. This is not tracking the units. We didn't put it into inventory, but cost of goods sold directly. So instead of going into inventory and then cost of goods sold, when we sell it, we just put it directly over here to cost of goods sold. Let's go to the income statement and check that out. So now uh, within the cost of goods sold, yeah, here it is in February. So there it is, boom. If I go into that, there's the transaction. So then if I go back, so now it looks kind of funny because it's like, okay, wait a second, there's a cost of goods sold, but there's no income. Usually the cost of goods sold should be tied to the same period you have income. That's why we do the inventory, but we're going to sell the inventory fairly soon. So if on the revenue side of things, you're selling the inventory, you could again, do the same thing, possibly wait till the inventory uh, clears the bank and record it as a deposit when it clears the bank. But it's likely that if you're if if you're recording it this way and you're using QuickBooks, the next thing that you might do is then invoice the client. You're like, okay, I've whittled down whatever it is. Now I'm going to have to tell the client that it's due, right? That they can pay me. Uh, like if it's your neighbor or something, you could you can go talk to them, right? But if you're 
if if you're doing some other system, the next thing would say, okay, I'm done with it. I'm going to invoice the client to tell them and then hopefully have them pay me, right? And the invoice is going to be an accrual thing. And therefore, I have to record it before it clears the bank. So I'm going to say this, let's just make up a customer. I'm just going to say this is customer one. And we're going to invoice them and save and then I'm gonna say the invoice number is there. They can pay me within 30 days. Invoice date, uh, that's a fine date. So 212, I'll keep it th there because we did it in February. Uh, let's, let's make it a little bit later. Uh, uh, that's the invoice date. I'm not sure when the original transaction, let's put it there. And then 216, they owe it on 317. And then I'm gonna invoice them. And so here's where we need a product, right? So I'm gonna make an item, but it's not gonna be an inventory item. So I'm gonna say, let's add an item. And we're gonna say, this is the things that I'm selling. I'm gonna call it inventory item one, whatever it is that I'm selling. The item uh, type uh, is going to be, whether it be service. Now it is inventory, but I don't wanna make it an inventory item because within QuickBooks, that'll tell QuickBooks that you want to track the inventory in units, not just dollars. So we can keep it as a, as a service item or like a non-inventory item, even though we're selling uh, the inventory. So I'm going to say, we'll just keep it there. And then I don't need a category. And then the description, inventory item one. And let's say that we sell it for $1,200. And I'm going to put it not into service income, but sale of product income because we're actually selling inventory. And so I'll put it, they're both income accounts, but I'll put it there. Now, if we were, and then I purchased this service from a vendor, I'm not going to deal with the purchase side uh, of things here. I'm just going to say create. And so now we're going to sell it for 1,003, uh, 1,200. Now, also, if you had to deal with sales tax, you could set up the sales tax here and deal with that. Uh, and the invoice is a form that can also help you with your sales tax calculations, in which case you'd have to set up the sales tax at your location. You'd have to then set up your items to say if they're taxable or not, uh, and then see if any customers are not subject to the tax or whatever. But at this point, what's this going to do? It's going to increase accounts receivable because it's an invoice. The other side's going to go to the revenue account. Uh, of the 1,200 and you're not going to have an impact decreasing cost, decreasing inventory and recording cost of goods sold because we already did that. We did that already. So, so we're going to say, because we just recorded the purchase directly to cost of goods sold. So it's not going to happen with the invoice. So I'm going to say, let's save it and close it and boom. And so if I do that, if I go back, to the balance sheet then and and uh, run it. Now we've got accounts receivable because we haven't collected the money yet, but accounts receivable goes up and the other side is going to then the revenue. So now the revenue looks correct in February. It looks appropriate, right? We've got 1,200 and the related cost of goods sold to earn that 1,200 was 678. So you, you see why, the, why there's an issue here. If, if this one, there's a timing difference. So if I put this on the books and I don't actually sell any inventory until next year, then it would look kind of funny, right? I should have them in the same period. That's why we use, why, that's why we put inventory in the books as an asset and then expense it either periodically or perpetually to put them in the same period. However, like I say, if, if you buy inventory and you don't hold on to it for a long period of time and then you sell it, you might still be able to get away with this because you will end up with the income and the expense basically in the same period in some cases. And so then that would be the easiest uh, thing to do. So next time we'll get into the more complex thing to do is to say, well, now these things don't exactly match up. So instead of recording the cost of goods sold as an expense, we're going to put it on the books as an asset. And if we put it on the books as an asset, we're going to have to then uh, track the asset and record it as an expense when we sell the inventory, which gets a little bit messy to track because we have to determine which type of inventory we sold and what the cost of the inventory was. And we can use either a perpetual or periodic inventory system. Okay, so if I go internally here and I go back to my transactions 
So we recorded that one. Uh, and so just note that if I go into my vendors, my vendors uh, in the expenses tab, where we can we can see this activity happening here as well. So the Office Depot transactions. And if I go into my vendors here, we can see uh, the Office Depot and I can see the activity uh, that has happened within Office Depot. And then I can, of course, determine the expense category accounts that we recorded these two. All right, uh, let's now, if I go to my balance sheet, this is where we stand at this point in time, if you're following uh, along. So now we still have negative cash because we haven't recorded the deposit side of things. We've got this accounts receivable because now we that wasn't from the bank feeds. We recorded an invoice, which is a non-cash uh, transactions to demonstrate that. And then we've got the machinery and equipment. We now have a positive down here. So the book value, if we take assets minus liabilities, there are none. That means the, the book value has a positive value at this point of 376 allocated to us, the owner uh, of the business. And so uh, in on the income statement, then we have the total income and expenses here of the 1,200 minus the cost of goods sold minus the other expenses gets us to our operating income 376, which is part of the balance sheet in that it's included in the equity. If I scrunch these two statements together into a trial balance, Here's uh, the trial balance, which is just basically the balance sheet on top of the income statement. There's my cash account. There's my machinery and equipment. Let's run it again. There's my cash account. There's my uh, accounts receivable asset. Uh, cash is negative. That's why it's a credit. Uh, it's a overdrawn because we haven't recorded deposits. There's my machinery and equipment. And then the income statement, revenue minus expenses. This income statement makes up equity and I can see that if I was to change the date 010125 to 010125 to the next year where it will close out the income statement accounts to one number in retained earnings. Now I just have, in essence, the balance sheet accounts.